Um, welcome uh, today to the last event of the day. I'm speaking in English because we have a panel <laughs> of uh, people from outside, besides uh, Diego here with, with me. Uh, this last event uh, is to present a common plan to end clock change in Europe. Um, it's a proposal we have been working for a year now, and we are very happy to be able to present it on a time use week. And for that, we not only have people that have actively participated on writing the proposal, but we also have uh, people from all over the world that are struggling with the same issue. Uh, here, Diego uh, from Argentina. We also have uh, JP coming from the States and a representative of the European Commission so that we can have a view as complete as possible on what, what are the issues around ending clock change and what is the specific proposal uh, we have. So this proposal has been elaborated by a work group composed uh, of representatives of institutions that have signed the Declaration of Barcelona on Time Policies last year, a group uh, that had uh, institutions but also key experts on the topic, and that together arrived to a consensus to a specific proposal um, with the goal of helping member states in the European Union reach uh, decision, have a practical discussion on how to end clock, ch clock changes in our, in our continent. But first, uh, before starting the discussion, uh, let me explain a bit what is the situation now, where we are in Europe regarding clock changes. Um, in 2008, the European Commission already approved a proposal to, abol to abolish the current directive and end clock changes which was ratified by the European Parliament in 2019. So the next step, the next logical step, let's say, of the process was for the member states to choose on which permanent time they, want, they wanted to stay. And this is where we are, three years later. Um, remember, this was approved in 2019, so yeah, three years later. This is on hold because of lack of consensus. So this is why we felt that a clear proposal was needed, and this is what we wanted to present and discuss with you today. So we are here today, I think we will see them on the screen soon, <laughs> uh, with Tizia Luengo and Manuela Lipinski, two of the authors of the proposal, also members of the International Alliance for Natural Time, an international uh, worldwide alliance of uh, people and institutions uh, fighting to end clock change worldwide, and that are representing also the countries of Germany and Netherlands in this alliance. So I don't know if we can see them in the screen soon, I hope. <laughs> um, but well, six of El Directo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hey. yes. <laughs> Hello, Tizia. Hello, Manuela. Thanks for being here. They are both muted, so... <laughs> Good afternoon. Hello, Good everybody. afternoon. <laughs> so, I'll start with uh, Manuela a bit. If you can explain what is exactly the proposal to end the clock change in the, you know, in the European Union. Uh, hi, it's muted. Uh, you're muted now. Yeah, no. Thank you, Ariadna. I would very much like to explain that. Um, so um, when we talk about clock changes, we are actually talking about switching between different time zones. So the question on which time do we want to stay permanently is actually a question, um, which time zone do we want our country to be in permanently? And to answer that question, it is useful that we first remember um, why do we have different time zones all over uh, the globe? Why don't we uh, just use a single time zone? And the answer is easy. It is to account for Earth's rotation and to account for the changing position of the sun. So speaking for our continent, the day occurs first in the uh, Eastern European countries, and then later the um, sun will flood um, the Central European states with light, and at the end, or after that, uh, it will reach Western Europe. So, and to account for this movement of the sun from east to west, and also to give everybody on the continent the possibility 
uh, to use this natural day-night cycle in a an healthy and an, in an enjoyable way, we need different time zones and we also need geographically correct time zones which um, are aligned as best as possible with the sun's position. And um, yeah, these are the so-called natural time zones. Unfortunately, at the moment, we are um, far away from this beneficial um, state. Uh, I would like to demonstrate that with, uh, for you on a map. So I'll share my screen. I hope you can all see that now. Yes, we can. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I would like you to first focus to the background of the image you see. In the background, you see the different uh, geographically correct time zones labeled in different colors. So, we have here on the European continent, the Eastern European time zone in red. In blue, you see the Central European time zone. In yellow, the Western European time zone and in green, in the very uh, west, the east, the Azorish time zone. Um, so these are four time zones, but if you now look at uh, the colors of the countries, um, which shows you which time zone are these countries at the moment using. So right now, today, you see that no European country is using the correct time zone. The Eastern European countries, they um, use wrongly Moscow time zone, which is not even part of our continent. The Central and the Western European countries, they use wrongly uh, Eastern European time. And the um, British Isles and Portugal in the far West, they use wrongly Central European time. Uh, a lot better it looks already after the upcoming clock change now on the weekend. We change back to what we call in most of the countries standard time or normal time. And here you can see that um, a lot of um, European member states are already in the right time zone. And these are the um, Eastern European member states and the Central European member states. The only remaining problem um, is um, the Western European member states. So the Benelux states, Spain, France, Ireland, uh, Portugal, and also in the Eastern or Central uh, Europe, um, a part of Greece, they are still not on their correct time zone. So what we propose is that, um, and that is the, the good news is we actually have an easy solution because we have borders of countries which allow that. We propose that all countries can use the natural time zone which look as follows year round. So this way, all time zones would be aligned as best as possible with the sun. Thank you, Manuela. Very clear, these maps uh, to understand uh, the proposal and the, the current situation. So Tizia, you are from the Netherlands. So uh, even with the standard time, just as Manuela was was saying, it seems you are not yet aligned with your natural time. So uh, what is the specific proposal uh, for the countries in your situation? Uh, yes, well, I'm half Spanish and I grew up near Alicante. <laughs> and as you can see on the map, uh, Spain and the Netherlands and all the westernmost countries of Europe, as well as Greece to the east, they're not using their natural time zones even during standard time. Uh, for these countries, we propose a two-step plan to achieve their best natural time zone with the least amount of social disruption using mechanism that we already have in place. And the first step applies to all European countries. Together, we abolish the clock changes in spring and stay on our current standard times. This is the situation we currently have the rest of the year that everybody's used to. And those countries who are already on their natural time zone, as Manuela just explained, from Sweden and Finland all the way down to Italy and Bulgaria, they don't, do not have to do anything else. And then step two is only for those countries that do not have the correct time zone yet, in yellow, uh, and Greece. We propose that these countries additionally turn back their clocks one last time in autumn, placing them on their best natural time zone, which they then adopt as their standard or normal time. And this turning back of the clock in autumn is also an action that society is used to and will not cause significant social disruptions. 
Thank you, Tizia. Very clear the two steps uh, proposed to change that. So we heard what's the proposal, how to arrive there. But uh, Manuel, I'm sure there's a reason why you are proposing this and not any other combination of time zones for the country. So why this time zone organization and not another? Yeah, there is a very good reason. So because these are uh, the natural time zones and it has been scientifically proven that uh, when clock time deviates too much from solar time, it has negative, significant negative effects on human health, on the economy, on education, and on safety. The reason for that is that misaligned clocks cause in the majority of us sleep deprivation and social jet lag. Um, we need to remember what is the actual um, natural state of using clock time because the idea or this practice of using misaligned clocks, of using false wrong time zones is a, a relatively recent one. And it has always, when it was implemented, not considered our human biology. For thousands of years, people lived um, by their inner clocks, which is regulated by the natural day-night cycle. Uh, I would like to show you or illustrate you uh, what that means. So um, people would in the evening naturally um, become tired by a relatively long um, darkness period. And in the morning, they would wake up uh, naturally because the day started and because they finished sleeping. And uh, later, we invented clocks with the purpose to communicate more easily what time of the day it is. But then everywhere on Earth, we used uh, solar time uh, on uh, where sun is in its highest position at 12 o'clock noon. We in implemented at the end of the 19th century artificial time zones, 24 artificial time zones around the globe. Um, and then clocks did not show solar time anymore, but they were still quite accurate because depending on where in the time zone you lived, uh, the clock only had a deviation from solar time by a maximum of 30 minutes, not more than that. So the clock time, still relatively reliable, uh, showed the real time of the day. But then in 1970s and in the 1980s, uh, most uh, European countries implemented daylight saving time with the intention to uh, save energy. We nowadays know uh, that daylight saving time does not save energy. That is a myth. It has been debunked already. But let me show you what daylight saving time does in our um, daily lives. So daylight saving time means that you rename clock time um, in the way you can see here. So everything, the entire schedules are shifted to one hour earlier. And that causes the following problem. Let's go back to our example. This person you can see here, imagine he needs to get up for work or for school between six or seven o'clock, between six and seven o'clock, which is quite common. He needs to feel tired or needs to become tired when it goes towards 22 o'clock so he can sleep on time. But most likely, because this 22 o'clock is now one hour earlier in the day-night cycle, he will still feel quite awake. And in the morning, when he needs to get up, it is also one hour earlier in the day-night cycle, so with a higher likelihood, he needs to use an alarm clock and interrupt his sleep. Um, an even worse situation we find in the Western European countries um, they have uh, been forced uh, during the Second World War by Hitler and Franco to adopt wrongly um, Western as uh, Central European time. And you can see here in this uh, visualization that that means that their clock time is already on standard time one hour earlier. Um, so this person here in our example, if he needs to get tired towards 22 o'clock, he will already have a problem with, with that in standard time and will still rather feel rather awake. And in the morning, uh, already in standard time for that, most likely need an alarm clock. And 
um, worse it is even when it comes to daylight saving time. Then we shift schedules another hour earlier and the problem increases. He will feel awake in the evening at the desired sleep time and therefore need even more an alarm clock. So what we are proposing is actually not, these are not time zones which we just invented out of a whim. Um, we are actually asking to finally re-implement the time zones which provide us all with a natural clock time, which firstly have been or had been used over centuries by people in accordance with our biology, with our inner clock. And secondly, which uh, have been proven scientifically to be the best for our health, for our economy, for our education and for our safety. And these are the time zones which would uh, give us these benefits. It's clear that this proposal sort of aligns the most with uh, our sun, right? Uh, geographically speaking, but you also said um, this has benefits uh, for human health, economy, safety. So I'm turning back uh, to this year. Um, can you uh, give specific examples on how this is uh, beneficial in these areas? Yes, um, it turns out that despite what some special interests claim, there are actually no proven benefits at all to daylight saving time. Uh, but there are many proven negative effects of misaligned clocks that affect the economy and our well-being. Uh, as Manala pointed out, DST was implemented to save energy, which it doesn't. And studies now show that we would actually save energy using natural time because there would be less need of extra heating in the mornings and air conditioning in the evenings. And, uh, well, health professor Mao will explain this in more detail later, but basically misaligned clocks cause, seriously affect our health and also our mental performance, as well as our children's development and learning abilities. So if we return permanently to our natural time zones, we would reap the benefits of increased mental and physical health and also of increased work performance, of better judgment, better decision making, more alertness, which means better overall results in all sectors. Uh, we would also see an increase in school performance, as well as less mental disorders and problems in our youth. And there will be less burnout, less workplace injuries and fatalities, and of course, less traffic accidents. Uh, there are also implications for the environment, because shifting industrial and social activity to later times of the day will reduce current early morning light pollution, which is only getting worse, and also air pollution, as it turns out that pollutant dispersion and maintenance of the atmosphere strongly depend on the time of day. And as for human rights, because of this impact on health and well-being, continuing these clock changes and living with the wrong time zones would be against human rights, as stated in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Uh, for all people, but especially for our children, who during adolescence become later chronotypes and are currently allowed to sleep less than the average adult at a time in their lives when they actually need more sleep. And uh, Professor Mayer will explain more about that. Thank you, Tizia, for the specific uh, examples. Uh, I know there, there are the specific studies also quoted in, in your proposal. Um, as I said, this is uh, now at a political impasse. So if someone wants to, to support uh, this proposal, um, help this to reach the right uh, people, uh, can you briefly explain what they can do? Uh, there are several ways in which people can contribute. Uh, well, scientists can join our working group on natural time to contribute with their research. And uh, public officials and managers can help spread the word by endorsing our proposal on the website and sharing it within their organizations and regions so that more people become aware of the benefits of adopting permanent natural time. And everybody can help raise awareness by organizing events and performances and other outings. And um, you can contact us for ideas and support. And you can also follow us on social media to help spread awareness. Uh, thank you, Tizia. Thank, thank you, Manuela, for this clear explanation. I think this, this is light with the BAP uh, says it all. So thank you a lot. Um, as I said, we are trying to give a, a view of what's happening on this issue around the world. And next, we have uh, Professor uh, Martha Mero. Uh, she's the... Um, the chair of the Institute for Medical 
as let me, from medical psychology at LMU uh, University in Munich, and she's also part of the European Biological Rhythm Society. Um, I hope we can see her soon. <laughs> Um, we asked her because, uh, to be here today because she's one of the top experts that uh, supported, on the, supported the group on, on writing this proposal. And we asked her to give us an, a bit of an in-depth explanation why this is important in terms of health and from a biological point of view. So I think that when we have her... <laughs> Hello, Martha. Hey. Hi, do you see me? Yes. Yep. <laughs> And you can hear me? Yes. Very good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen also, so scientists like to use slides as crutches quite often. Let's see where we are in the presentation. Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. My, and then I'm going to try to make it into the presentation mode. And then we should be good to go. Now it's okay? perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to, I have 10 minutes to talk about biology and health and already Manuela and Tizia have highlighted some of the things I'm going to highlight, but maybe I show a little bit of data as scientists like to do. Um, I, I think I'm here representing the entire biologic, uh, European Biological Rhythm Society. That's one of the reasons I'm here. I'm yes. also the head of the Education Committee for the Society for Research on Biological Rhythms, which is the big international society. And I've also worked on the topic uh, a bit in my uh, scientific past. Um, before I get into the material, I wanted to really compliment this working group, which is, I'm just so impressed with your um, strategic insights and patience and persistence on the topic. And I'm also really thrilled to see that Save Standard Time from Twitter, JP, is online because he's really doing a lot of hard work and uh, very dedicated on Twitter. So you should follow him if you want to follow this issue for sure. Um, so to get you into this material quickly, so this is, this is my top, my job here is to talk of, talk about this topic. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you to stop and reflect on um, uh, your preferred sleep timing. So, do you sleep earlier or later than others in your household? Uh, most people can right away think about the, diff the different people that they're living with and realize that they are um, they're driven to sleep earlier or later. Um, the teenagers tend to sleep later, as you've heard. The younger children tend to sleep earlier. But even adults, even adult, adults at all ages, will have these tendencies to be aggravatingly going to bed earlier or later than others. And so um, Till Ronoberg and I quantified this quite some years ago using the Munich Chronotype Questionnaire. And there are a couple of other questionnaires that have been used also, but this is, this is what, what the MCTQ shows. And what you see here is a graphical representation of chronotype. And uh, I hope you can appreciate the inter-individual variety in this trait just from looking at the graph. And um, um, just to, to not go into it in too much detail, but to tell you that basically if you think about people sleeping around eight hours a day, this tells you that people are sleeping, uh, centering their sleep more or less between midnight and uh, eight in the morning on average. But you can see how much variety there is. You can see that, um, that there are quite a lot of people that are sleeping um, uh, later than that, than that average time over here and a few people that are sleeping earlier than that time. And if you think about it, think about if you're sleeping eight hours a day and if your sleep is centered around four or five in the morning, and then if you have to get up for work or school, you're going to have to use an alarm clock. And so if you, if you think about it this way, then basically all of the people to the right of this red line, um, if they're following a, a typical social schedule, are going to have to use an alarm clock every single work or school day. That is most of the population by a lot. So um, what happens when you use an alarm clock is that you deprive yourself of sleep, which is what you've also um, heard referred to. And here you see uh, this graphically represented from a Ronaberg et al. paper, where you see that on work days, people are sleeping much shorter than on free days as you get to later chronotypes. And this gets up to be almost a few hours a day every day, um, uh, week in and week out, work week in, in and work week out. What happens when you deprive yourself of sleep? So 
why do we care? Most of us can actually, uh, we, most of us feel like we compensate for this very well and we perform uh, uh, reasonably well. David Dingus did a wonderful experiment um, some years ago where he showed that sleep deprivation through the week is cumulative. Every day that you're sleep deprived adds up and increases uh, in almost a linear fashion how, how poorly you perform on, for instance, reaction time tasks. So that by the end of the week, you're performing, think of it either in terms of legal intoxication rates, so you're performing almost as badly as if you are legally intoxicated, or as badly, or you're performing as badly as though you've been sleep deprived for an entire night. So it's just, it adds up, two plus two plus two plus two equals eight hours of sleep deprivation by the end of the week. And if you ask these people how they're performing, they don't, sense this and so we have it we compensate somehow for this we don't we don't understand we don't realize how badly we're performing as a result of sleep deprivation julia cerbini uh, quantified this in terms of exam scores and of course tina if t if i've told you teenagers are late chronotypes then they will be particularly sleep deprived during the week and in these dutch high schools she showed that uh, exam scores were statistically significantly poorer in these subjects that reflect fluid intelligence, that has to do with intelligence that is, uh, deals with problem solving, as opposed to crystallized intelligence, intelligence which, has, which has to do with um, uh, more memorization tasks. Um, and so this, of course, I think for all of us, um, we have to be very concerned with things that uh, impact uh, the learning, the, the, the capability to learn of teenagers. And then another uh, work, this time from Celine Vetta and uh, Till Ronneberg, showing that social jet lag, this, this um, uh, I should have, should have defined social jet lag, so the, the, um, the habitual uh, difference in sleep t and in the timing of behavior that occurs with the work week compared to the f uh, free to free days. So bouncing back and forth work week to free days, we call that social jet lag because you're living as though you're in different time zones. And if you have more social jet lag as a late chronotype, generally, um, then you are at a, a tremendously increased risk for overweight. And all of these things are speaking to issues that are extremely important to um, uh, society, uh, both for health and in terms of uh, total uh, economic impact, efficiency, productivity, and so on, and well-being. So um, as I talked about chronotype, I talked about the, the, the sleep uh, preference of sleep timing. We often hear that, that, that sleep timing preference has been measured. But I think we all can understand that um, the drive to sleep at a certain time is not really a preference. It feels a bit stronger than a preference somehow. Uh, it feels not like we've chosen it, but like it's chosen us. And indeed, if we look at the three things that are mainly determining chronotype, it's genes, the light environment, and age. And genes and age we can do nothing about. We're, we're, those are, those are um, occurring to us, not um, because of us. Uh, but the light environment we have some control over, and that's, of course, what we're talking about here, is artificially adjusting our light environment. So um, uh, if that's true, if, you know, what, what effect does the light environment have, then we can refer to this recent paper um, by a group of economists which actually analyzed what happens across time zones to, um, to different measures. Uh, because if, if the, light in, the local light environment <clears throat> impacts um, how well we perform, for instance, we should see uh, this as a natural experiment that we're doing. And indeed, they found that... Um, People at the western side of the time zone sleep 19 minutes less. They uh, score significantly uh, poorer on health measures. They, they earn less money. And I can't remember what was this study or a different study showed that there are actually more cancers at the western side of the time zone compared to the eastern side of the time zone where you have lower social jet lag because of the, the um, earlier sunrise. This is a graphic which shows what happens um, with, with uh, uh, daylight saving time and the transition in a, lati uh, a uh, longitude like Barcelona, as in Barcelona. And um, you see uh, local time over here. here. Here is noon at this red line, the solar noon, I should say, solar, solar midday. And um, just, when, um, just when the photo period is going to help you, 
um, you're actually pushing it back so that dawn will come actually later, uh, earlier again, now later again. And so you start to get a benefit from the increasing photo period, which you then give away <clears throat> due to daylight saving time. So daylight saving time basically ensures, ensures misalignment of the circadian clock um, uh, with the light environment because of social life, because of social constraints. And accordingly, um, sleep becomes shortened, uh, typically, at least during, during the work week. So the position, the position of all scientists, scientific groups, groups that I know, not all scientists, but all scientific groups that I know of and medical groups that I know of, is that they favor permanent standard time compared to daylight saving time, compared to the change and also to permanent daylight saving time. And this is because we know that people will sleep longer because people will be happier. Um, there are some associations with depression and social jet lag because they'll be wealthier, uh, they'll be healthier, and they'll be smarter. And um, scientists are all about data. And uh, for, fortunately or unfortunately, this experiment has already been done in modern times twice. So uh, in the 70s, uh, the US actually did an experiment with permanent daylight saving time that did not last long. And they reverted back, they reverted then to a, um, a bouncing a schedule where they had daylight saving time in the summer and standard time in the, in the winter. And more recently, Russia has done this experiment where they have um, uh, tried for, I think, three and a half years, they tried um, daylight saving time. And it was incredibly unpopular. Um, they, they switched back uh, because of stress, stress and health issues they also saw increased um, road accidents in the traffic accidents in the morning. And um, there are reports of how, how horrific it was to be, basically be waking up children and going to work in complete darkness for weeks and months on end in the winter time. Uh, their conclusion was that dark mornings have a worse effect on people's state of health than dark evenings do. And thus the, um, uh, the uh, abolishment of that policy. So uh, the solution is uh, to switch, uh, stop switching the clocks, but only if we can stay on permanent standard time. So switching the clocks to a permanent daylight saving time would be a, a decrement. The, the Russian study showed that clearly. That's Borisinov et al. And, um, uh, but the optimal program would be, as was outlined my, beautifully by Manuela and Ticia, wonderful constructive proposal that we should uh, revert to permanent standard time and stay there without changing. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for letting us represent this position here. Thank you, Martha, for exposing it so clearly and, and with data, right? Uh, as you said, scientists love data, mm. but I think it's, it's useful to see it clear on a, on a graph, right? Uh, to, a to picture's worth a thousand words. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so we are very lucky here today because we are not only talking about Europe, but do we have two, uh, two panelists, uh, Diego here uh, coming from Argentina and J JP uh, hopefully connected from the States, who will also explain what's the situation outside Europe, because this is not a struggle uh, that is happening here, but it's happening in different parts of the world. So we will start with uh, Jay. Uh, JP is the founder of Safe Standard Time, uh, one of the main associations in the, well, the main association in the States uh, fighting to end clock change. Uh, hi, Jay, now I see you. Um, and we asked him to give us an overview on what's the situation, what's the discussion that's happening in the States regarding staying on permanent standard time, on permanent DST, and so on. So. Jay, whenever you're ready. Well, hello, good day, and um, good morning from Phoenix, Arizona. I wanted to say that my local time is 0609, and my solar time is 0558. So we are only about 10 minutes off from our correct, our most natural time possible. It's, it's uh, a pleasure and a privilege to be in a state that, that does not observe daylight saving time here in the United States. But Arizona is in the minority. Um, the 48 of the 50 states do the uh, changing of the clocks uh, from summer into daylight saving time. And 
uh, back to standard time for the winter. And we have had um, a, a strong push in the recent years to get rid of the clock change. And only in the last year or two um, have, has the discussion been about which clock to keep. Very similar, I understand, to what you have in Europe. There was a, uh, you, you know, uh, granted, I think these people had the best of intentions, but we do have an emotional attachment to summer and so many people would choose the daylight saving clock uh, outright. Uh, but I've been very pleased with the uh, scientific community um, and, and others, uh, parents and teachers, uh, some religious leaders coming forward and saying, no, standard time is the correct clock to keep. Um, so we had an explosion of bills at the state level to be going to permanent daylight time, which thankfully could not be put into place because federal law prohibits that. Um, our federal law lets us uh, opt out of daylight saving time and keep standard time permanently, which is how Arizona and Hawaii uh, avoid the clock change game. So we have been working in recent years to slow and stop these bills for permanent daylight time, which we're making progress on, and to encourage legislators instead to introduce legislation for permanent standard time. Um, I myself uh, in Safe Standard Time, we're working primarily in the United States, but we also um, keep an eye uh, and a toe in, uh, in Canada and Mexico. Canada has had a very similar situation with bills popping up for daylight time. We've been able to defeat some of them. Um, and Mexico is very interesting. They are going straight to permanent standard time. They are not even considering permanent daylight time. So we're very pleased with the progress there. Thank you, Jay. Very good to hear that uh, in some cases there's progress mm -hmm. and, and that you are uh, there <laughs> to ensure that it happens. Um, so to finish a bit our overview on what's happening around the world, we have uh, Diego Golombek. Uh, he's a biologist in Kilmes University, I'm saying that correctly, and researcher at CONSET. Um, so what we asked him to do today is to give us a bit of an overview of what's the situation mm -hmm. in Argentina and more uh, broadly in Latin American countries. Okay, uh, Spanish or English? As you, como quieras. <laughs> We're in Spain. <laughs> eh, bueno, primero, muchas gracias por nombrarme Europeo Honorario para, para esta sesión. <laughs> y les propongo un, un, imaginar un juego. Si viniera un grupo de extraterrestres a estudiar las costumbres y geografía de este planeta, cuando tuvieran que hacer el informe en extraterrestria, cuando vuelvan, se llevaría una sorpresa bastante grande. ¿no? Dirían, al, al decir de Obelix, dirían, están locos estos terráqueos. ¿verdad? A menos que aparezca el extraterrestre politólogo que diga, no, ya entendí cuál es el problema. Las zonas horarias en el planeta Tierra no están establecidas geográficamente, sino políticamente que es lo que sucede si uno ve el mapa de las zonas horarias, no corresponden a los usos horarios, sino a convenciones políticas. Por eso es que los extraterrestres se llevarían a estas sorpresas de países que abarcan muchos sus usos horarios y tienen una sola, una sola zona horaria, como China, o países que abarcan un uso horario o dos y tienen más de dos o tres zonas horarias, países que tienen zona horaria y media, como Venezuela, que hace unos años decidió cambiar media hora para diferenciarse de sus vecinos, es una situación bastante complicada en cuanto a las zonas horarias. Eh, y dado que es una convención política, desde la convención de 1920 de, de, de zonas horarias, la solución tiene que ser política, no solamente científica. El problema es que en la mayoría de los casos a la política no le interesa la evidencia. Y es lo que estamos viendo cuando no se llega a consensos una vez presentadas las evidencias. Y antes de contarles un poco la, la, la situación este, latinoamericana, me parece que en algunas cosas nos estamos equivocando, como científicos, para presentar la evidencia. Eh, estamos haciendo lo que en comunicación de la ciencia se, se, se asemeja a la invasión de napoleónica de Rusia. Esto lo menciona Pierre Fayard, un gran, un gran comunicador de la ciencia. Dice, Napoleón creó un gran ejército para arrasar con Rusia. Del otro lado no había nadie. ¿Por qué? Pues los rusos esperaron que llegara el invierno y lo pasaron por encima. Los científicos hacemos lo mismo. Vamos con la antorcha de la ciencia, el gran ejército, a convencer al mundo de que la evidencia es esta. Y del otro lado no hay nadie. Nadie quiere ser evangelizado con la ciencia. Porque, recién decía Jay, hay un toque emocional, 
hay otra serie de factores que no estamos teniendo en cuenta. Vamos con la evidencia, que es lo que más apreciamos nosotros, y nos falta algo y no logramos un consenso. Y hay cosas que no estamos haciendo. Por ejemplo, echar mano, en estos casos en particular, a las ciencias del comportamiento, a behavioral science. No hemos hecho campañas de nudges, de empujoncitos, empujoncillos, a propósito del de tiempo, las zonas horarias, el, el uso horario. Y la segunda cosa es que no hemos involucrado a los jóvenes en la discusión. La fuerza de los jóvenes en este momento es más fuerte que en cualquier otro momento de la historia y lo podemos demostrar con lo que está sucediendo con las políticas a propósito de cambio climático, que son lideradas por jóvenes y después, en todo caso, adoptadas por la representación política. No debiéramos hacer algo similar con eh, el tema del de, eh, el uso horario y de los cambios de horario. Creo que sí. Ejemplo, ver qué, qué redes sociales utilizar. Sí, si seguimos utilizando solamente Twitter, vamos a estar hablándonos a nosotros. ¿sí? Entonces, simplemente una reflexión desde afuera, desde el lado de comunicación de la ciencia más que de ciencia, de por qué un, alguna de las razones por las cuales considero que estamos estancados en la discusión, y no solo estancados, sino que a veces vamos para atrás, como algunos estados en Norteamérica, en Estados Unidos, como mencionaba Jay. Vayamos ahora sí a Latinoamérica. En Latinoamérica, incluyendo México, que es parte de, de Norteamérica, pero lo consideramos Latinoamérica, obviamente, hay cinco países que siguen haciendo cambio de uso horario eh, dos veces al año. Estos países son México, que ahora está avanzando hacia, hacia eh, horario estándar permanente, Chile, Uruguay, Cuba y Haití. Eh, no hay un gran consenso para evitar estos cambios, ni tampoco para establecer en cuál quedarse, porque una vez que uno decide no cambiar más, obviamente la decisión es me quedo en Standard Time o en DST. Algunas situaciones son particularmente interesantes porque se mezcla en Latinoamérica, así como en otros países, se mezcla eh, el establecimiento de horarios de verano e invierno con el uso horario que corresponde a cada país, que en general está mal establecido en nuestros países. Chile pese a que no logró abolir el cambio de horario, logró algo fundamental, que es cambiar el uso, el, la zona horaria. Chile estaba establecido en la zona horaria menos 3, o sea, 3 grados al oeste de Greenwich, y logró estar un poco más cerca de su uso horario natural, que es el menos 5, estableciéndolo en menos 4. Esto fue una discusión que se dio en el Parlamento, también con un lobby de científicos presentando evidencia. Costó muchísimo hacerlo, pero se logró. En Uruguay esa discusión no se está dando, no sé cuál es la situación en Cuba y en Haití. Y les cuento la situación en Argentina, que es bastante curiosa. Argentina adhirió al, a la Convención Internacional de eh, Usos Horarios y Zonas Horarias en 1920, unos años más tarde que se estableciera, con el uso horario correcto, con la zona horaria correcta, menos 4, o sea, 4 grados, 4 usos horarios al oeste del de meridiano de Greenwich. Después decidieron empezar a alternar entre verano e invierno con la misma excusa de eh, ahorro energético. Porque en ese momento los datos aparentaban dar un mayor ahorro energético si uno hacía los cambios de uso horario. A partir de entonces se hicieron 52 cambios de uso horario en Argentina, tomando en cuenta los cambios de verano e invierno. Y en algún momento se dijo, bueno, paremos, ya no tiene sentido, no estamos cerrando energía. Se estaba alternando entre menos 3 y menos 2 pero se paró estableciendo el uso horario en menos dos, o sea, dos usos horarios al oeste de Greenwich. En ese momento estábamos azorados, pero no azorados por sorprendidos, porque estábamos en las Islas Azores, básicamente, estábamos en el medio del océano Atlántico. Después, afortunadamente, se volvió al uso horario menos tres, que no es el que nos corresponde geográficamente, pero al menos se acerca. En este momento, en Argentina no hay cambios de verano e invierno, pero estamos en un horario que no corresponde y nuestro trabajo con las legislaturas es tratar de volver al uso horario menos cuatro. Nos cuesta muchísimo. Estamos con mucho apoyo de las, países, las provincias que están más hacia el oeste, con muy poco apoyo de las provincias que están hacia el este. Y obviamente la política es consensuar y no estamos logrando consensuar porque no estamos proponiendo los argumentos de la manera adecuada, contándolo como se contó acá, contándolo de una manera mucho más abierta a, a la gente. ¿Y cuál es el problema cronobiológicamente? Algo mencionó Marta. Nosotros lo que proponemos es favorecer la luz matinal versus la luz vespertina, porque cronobiológicamente sabemos que es la más saludable. La luz de la mañana es la nafta del reloj biológico, es la que lo pone en hora y permite mantener el alerta durante mucho tiempo. 
Pero a la gente no le gusta eso y tiene todo su derecho a que no le guste. La gente dice, así me robás horas de la tarde, horas de luz de la tarde. Y la discusión, un poco en broma, en Estados Unidos es, me robás las horas que puedo jugar al golf. Y hecho esto estuvo en los diarios de esa manera. Y si nosotros seguimos diciendo, no, necesitas la luz de la mañana porque el reloj biológico, por la salud, no vamos a hacer mella, no vamos a hacer cambios. Tenemos que pensar, así como se pensó cómo lograr mucha más, mayor adherencia para las vacunas, que no fue simplemente por una cuestión de evidencia científica, sino también por cuestiones emocionales, tenemos que lograr otro tipo de argumentos. En algo estamos fallando desde la ciencia y creo que tenemos que ser lo suficientemente humildes para reflexionar cuál es ese fallo y lograr esos consensos. La política es el arte de generar consensos. Si no los logramos, y al decir de un maravilloso poeta vuestro, Blas de Otero, nos quedamos en palabras y las palabras entonces no sirven, son palabras. Gracias, Diego, por resituar también el problema. Um, uh, I'm going to change to English again. <laughs> uh, but I think it's very useful because we have our last uh, panelist, uh, which is coming from policy, and I think this is the key, as you said, we need to generate this consensus, we need to, to take a political decision. So we have invited uh, Ms. Sophie Tramp, uh, from, uh, she's a policy officer at DigiMove in the European Commission, and we have kindly asked her to evaluate our proposal, to do a bit of a reflection on what this might mean for Europe or where we are uh, from her uh, point of view. So thank you, Sophie, for accepting our invitation and whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you, you can hear me. Hello, yes, Hello from Brussels. Um, indeed, as you rightly mentioned, uh, I'm dealing with this uh, proposal on abolishing summertime uh, that you already mentioned earlier here in the European Commission, and I'm happy to share my thoughts uh, from, from the European perspective. Um, you also uh, summarized very well where we are on, on this proposal, so I just uh, quickly recall we, uh, the European Commission proposed this, uh, this idea of abolishing the seasonal time changes four years ago in 2018. Uh, at that time, we felt uh, quite a strong support. There was an increasing questioning if these uh, time changes are still useful. We had uh, some member states questioning that. We had the European Parliament asking the Commission to assess the current regime. Uh, and we had uh, the great support from citizens uh, that participated in, in a public consultation. There were more than uh, 4 million people participating and more than 80% speaking in favor of abolishing uh, those time changes. So um, we published the proposal, you rightly mentioned the European Parliament uh, adopted it quite quickly with only minor changes. But to, to explain to you a bit the, the European Union um, legislative process, you need the consent of the Parliament and you need member states to, to also accept the proposal or both need to come to an agreement uh, on, on this legislation. So our role as commission is to propose things. We can't really decide on, on, on what, what happens with them. So unfortunately, uh, you mentioned it uh, on, on the side of member states, which is national governments. Uh, things uh, went less well, uh, basically, as you said, since three years, uh, this uh, proposal is blocked, meaning uh, we don't even have discussions at, uh, at member states level on the proposal. It's just uh, somewhere in the drawers of, of the council and member states don't want to take it out and discuss it. This happens also with other proposals. It's not unusual. We have uh, several proposals being blocked in the council, some because they're political politically very uh, controversial, some because member states simply are not interested in having a legislation uh, in, this, uh, in this particular sector. So this is not un unusual uh, for Brussels. Uh, what can we do? Uh, I mean, we as Commission, our powers are limited. I mean, we talk to, to the parties, we talk to member states, we talk to the presidencies. Uh, you might know the Council is organized with different presidencies, six months 
uh, for every member state then the presidency is turning so with every incoming presidency we discuss the, the the proposals on the table their priorities we always push asking please reopen discussions on on this proposal on end time changes so far we always got the answer they don't see sufficient support um, amongst member states, so the presidency don't even put the proposal up for, for discussion. This is frustrating, but this is the situation. So thanks uh, also in this regard uh, for, for your work, for your proposal, and also um, Manuela, what you say, what you can do to support those proposals and to, to disseminate it and, and make it known and a bit um, trigger the, the public discussion, which eventually might also push member states to, to get a bit more active and, and, and consider this proposal again. Uh, a, a few words on the content. I mean, it's very much aligned with what the, the Commission has been proposing uh, four years ago, because it stresses uh, like that the, the coordinated approach is, is needed, that we need coherent time zones, not a patchwork. Uh, and you also uh, very well um, uh, define this coordinated transition for all member states. We have, we have one point where we end the clock change. We have a second point where we can change back depending on what the future standard time would be. This from, from our European uh, perspective is quite crucial because for us, it's also about a unified regime, about the internal market, so that you can have a travel, transport, communication services that are not disturbed by uh, uncoordinated uh, time, time changes. Uh, what is different from, from uh, your proposal, what we couldn't uh, propose as a commission, is this map of uh, future time zones, because we consider it's for the member states to decide which time zone is more uh, appropriate for them once we, we finish the, the summertime uh, uh, regime because simply the European Union doesn't have competence to, to, um, to put a certain member state in a certain time zone to choose a standard time. But our uh, approach was as well that of course they would coordinate with neighboring uh, countries so that we don't have a, a patchwork uh, in the end. Uh, um, as I said, thanks a lot uh, for your support. We still receive many letters, and now we will receive even more as <laughs> the next uh, clock change is approaching, uh, from citizens who still ask us to pursue <laughs> with this idea of uh, stop the clock change. We still also get support from members of the European Parliament, so the discussion is still alive. And we are also happy to see, uh, and thanks you for presenting those uh, elements as well, that outside Europe there are initiatives uh, that might also trigger the discussion at European level again, as you said in the US, uh, the Sunshine Protection Act. We see at the level of the G7, for example, all member states except from UK have initiatives ongoing on stop clock chains. Japan, that will have the next presidency of the G7, doesn't have clock change. So there, there is still some, some dynamics uh, in this topic. And um, thanks, thanks again for your help. And that was my little state of play from Brussels. Happy to take questions if there are any later. Thank you, Sophie, uh, for this analysis. So it is quite a, a conundrum, let's say. Uh, we have a solution. We have a scientific consensus. Uh, we are not alone because there's issues around this the clock change all around the world, but still we are not getting the change, no? as you so clearly put it, we are not reaching <laughs> where we have to. Um, so the idea for this session is that you were able to also ask questions, but if you don't have, I will shoot as well. Uh, we have all the panelists here, I hope, yes. Um, I don't know if someone has a question. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a microphone or not? <laughs> yeah, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming over over here. Yes, thank you. Uh, this morning we spoke a lot about the gender aspect. And uh, Manuela and Ticia, you, you, you spoke about some benefits. 
if we change. Um, but is there um, any benefit especially for women or a gender aspect, Zach, if you can explain that? I'll have to think about that. Um. <laughs> I don't have an answer right about that. Ah, right okay. Now. Uh, let me wait because there's other questions. So maybe we ask all the questions and then we do a round of, uh, of answers. <laughs> Thank you very much to, for this interesting panel. Um, as we were seeing, no, there is a strong consensus among even some politicians, uh, European citizens that also wanted to abolish that, and, um, and the scientific com community. But my question is more for Diego and for the other speakers. We are not reaching people. This is not the main topic, no? You go to the street and people is not talking about that when the benefits are very clear. Uh, I would like to hear from you uh, some ideas of what else can we do? So maybe we do a round of the gender uh, question and what else can we do uh, more or less on the order we spoke. So Tizia, Manuela, you want to start and then we move to Professor Merrill. Um, so I think um, that the topic is usually discussed in only one perspective, uh, which is, do I want daylight after work or do I not want daylight after work? And if you ask this way, I think it's clear that people say, sure, I want daylight after work. But uh, it should be discussed more, also seeing the other side of the coin. For most people, it is not pleasant to get up early and they would like to sleep a bit longer in the morning, and they would also like to stay up longer. If you really see, when do people when go to bed in summer? They don't go to bed when they should because they actually want to enjoy the long summer evenings. If they, in daylight saving time, would go to bed when they should, they would not have the long summer evening. They would need to bring their children to bed before the sunset. And this is nothing pleasant. A lot of parents have discussions with their children that they don't want to sleep because it's a bright day outside. And we need to focus more to where are the problems of daylight saving time so people recognize, hey, look, if you had standard time, you actually would have the luxury of enjoying this long summer evening, even if you have children and you need to bring them to school next day. And I think this discussion needs to shift more into this direction. And secondly, there are people who uh, say they prefer daylight saving time. But if you ask them, um, OK, look, you go to work at 9. Do you have the chance to go to work at 8 o'clock? So you would also have this hour of sunlight. Then they answer, yeah, but I don't want to get up so early. And they don't understand that daylight saving time actually means that you go get up an hour earlier. So people need to understand what they actually do with this fake clock time. And I would hope that uh, by shifting the discussion into this direction, you can reach more people. So maybe a shift on the, on the way we present the issue. That, that's a bit the suggestion of Manuela. Uh, maybe I would turn to uh, Professor uh, Martha Mero and Professor Diego Golombek here uh, to answer both the gender uh, dimension. I don't know if there's that. You are, I, I'm asking you because you are the two <laughs> scientists on the panel. And also if you want to comment on, on how to reach uh, more people. Um, you want you start, Diego, and then we move to Professor Mer. I'm, I'm not an expert on gender, not at all, but an obvious explanation would be, would be that since women are uh, the ones that get the most of the burden out of, of raising children and taking care of children, then the children would be better, right? Because they would wake up at a more natural time and during daytime. That's one of those. The other one is. Uh, if, if people doing uh, domestic work have to travel a lot during the morning, that's also much better for women in, in that sense. It's an obvious explanation since I'm not an expert on gender. And, and regarding the other question, what should we do? Um, I, I mentioned two, two very simple um, proposals. One has to do with, with nudges uh, that we are trying in, in a similar uh, way. We are trying nudges for what, something that's now being called sleep procrastination, which means you know you have to go to bed, to bed earlier, but you don't, right? 
So you procrastinate the time for going to bed. And we are starting a campaign for getting uh, WhatsApp messages and Twitter and TikTok messages saying, hey, what time is it? Are you sure you don't need to go to bed? We don't have the answer yet. We'll, we'll tell you about that <laughs> later. And the other thing, I'm still keen on, on involving uh, younger people, uh, mostly uh, adolescents, because they are the ones that suffer the most of waking up early and working up during the night. And they can be very powerful in terms of, of lobbying for scientists. And as said, they have demonstrated that very clearly in terms of climate change. Yeah. Thank you, Diego. Uh, Professor Mero, I don't know if you want to add anything to, to this. Sure. Um, so I, I can speak to a couple of things. That the quote-unquote quote gender question. So <clears throat> the um, immunocrotin chronotype questionnaire data was actually collected based on a self-declared um, uh, uh, sex, so I think it actually pertains to biological sex more than to gender. And that data showed that women are actually slightly, slightly, very slightly earlier chronotypes than, than men are for, uh, at least in the young adult lives. And so that would actually imply that there would be a larger benefit of this policy um, for men in, in this case. Um, so that's one, that's one aspect. And in terms of what more there is to do, um, you know, I think that, yes, yes, you, 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 get, this, um, you get this very complicated uh, um, emotional qu uh, plea from many people. Don't take, away, don't take away my summer evenings. I love my summer evenings. And I think um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's really difficult, actually, to argue against and to address. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually a little bit lost on that. So people who really, I really talked to for a long time even come back and say uh, that they might not be convinced on that point. Um, uh, I think one thing that would be, you know, so it's all about motivation then. It's on one hand education, on the other hand motivation. And um, I think that one thing we could do better is to actually assess the cost. So some of the things that I talked about in terms of what we know from epidemiological studies concerning what are the cumulative effects of chronic sleep deprivation that come with social jet lag. Um, these kinds of things are, they have a huge cost to society. They have a cost in terms of um, intelligence and education. They have a cost in terms of population diseases like depression, like metabolic diseases and overweight and the consequences thereof. And I, there, there is no really strong quantification of what that costs society. It probably means that all of our insurance premiums for health insurance, all of us are paying more for this because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drip, drip, drip into, into this bucket that we need to all pay for. And I guess that um, we could all, we would all benefit from having a few more euros in our pocket, so maybe that's one way to get to motivate people by having a very, very good estimate of what it really is costing our society financially. Thank you, Martha, uh, for this too. We are a bit out of our time, so I would ask uh, both uh, Sophie and Jay from their different perspective if they have uh, one idea uh, to bridge this change, um, Sophie mentioned, this is something that is been going on, so what can we do? And Jay, you have your experience from the States, um, so something that we can do to accelerate this change, to make it happen. Well, uh, yes, um, it, there is the emotional attachment to summer with daylight saving time, and, and uh, there are some people who think that uh, because the sun goes down at five o'clock in the winter, if we had standard time in the summer, the sun might go down at five o'clock in the summer. And that's, that's simply not the case. That's, that's not the way the astronomy behind uh, the seasons actually works. We would still have uh, this, the sun staying up later in the summer than we would in the winter. And um, really when we're setting our clock forward an hour, um, we get to leave work early, which is desirable, but then we have to go to work earlier in the morning and that's undesirable, I think. If you were to ask most people, do they want to get up an hour early, especially in the winter when it's when it's cold or it's icy uh, and it's dark, they, they would say, no, I don't want to do that. But that's what daylight time in the winter would force them to do. Um, we have found taking photographs of the morning, uh, showing what it looks like 
um, at, at eight o'clock a.m. on standard versus daylight has been very helpful to elucidate uh, this situation. Uh, and there's been a lot of benefit as well from uh, scientists and doctors speaking to uh, to journalists uh, or engaging directly on social media to to uh, improve the uh, the public education of, of the situation. So better science communication, as you mm -hmm. were saying, and, and using these pictures mm -hmm. to to really get the message uh, across. Something very very short um, regarding what Jay was saying. Uh, I would like to see, to see the, the the bright side of the debate that it's happening. Right? And there are not too many examples on scientists uh, interacting with, uh, with communicators, with people uh, lobbying and doing a very good campaign like Jay, with policymakers, and I think that's a very good um, uh, side of the story. Yes, really true. <laughs> uh, so for just one minute, uh, if you have one to add, uh, any idea here? Just to... to, to, to uh, uh, confirm what uh, Diego what, was just saying. Yeah, we would need uh, like campaigns to, to, to make national governments move on this issue, at least from my European uh, perspective. Because uh, it's true, many people say, you know, this issue has been uh, covered. We had other crises, COVID, the Ukraine war. Uh, so um, the European Union is occupied with other issues, which is true, but still there's so many things going still on, business as usual. So it's not true that this topic needs to wait until we have solved all the other big crises. So, uh, voila, continue <laughs> to, to push your national politicians to, to keep this on the agenda. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, all the panelists, uh, for today's session. Just wanted to end uh, by remembering what we have planned for tomorrow. Tomorrow is the world, um, the world encounter of uh, local and regional government, so I invite you all to be there. We'll talk about time policies at the local and regional level. I think it will be a very interesting uh, debate, that especially we'll have a debate on sustainability um, and time and mobility. So I hope I'll see you all tomorrow, and thank you a lot for being here. Thank you. <laughs>